Airline pilots have a drinking and flying competition, and a pilot has a code brown situation in flight. In this episode of Cockpit Confessionals. Coming up. Hey 74 crew, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name's Kelsey. I'm a 747 pilot. My channel 74 Gear is all about aviation. I've had a lot of people requesting to do more cockpit confessionals, so obviously you all like them. If you have a story that is a crew member that you can send to me, the easiest way to do it is either send it via Instagram or you can send it through the free form I created for you guys. There is a section there for suggested videos and suggestions on things that we can do to improve everything. So you can leave it in both places and who knows, maybe it ends up here. I tell a lot of these stories in first person, but for obvious reasons, I am not involved in any of these stories. I've not participated or done any of them. Let's get into it. Every time we show up to set up a flight, the captain and the first officer are usually kind of making some small talk. Where have you been flying? How long have you been here? Things like that. They're kind of filling out each other to establish some rapport. And I can't stress this enough for this particular story. This person that told me this story, it's not something that I can stress enough just how stupid it is. So please, please, please do not do it. You can ruin your career, you can kill yourself, or you could kill other people. Don't do this story. Basically what this captain said is when we were talking about what have they been doing in the last couple of days off, he said, yeah, I just had my annual landing competition with a couple of buddies from the military that we went through flight school together and now we're at the airlines. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Where do you guys do that? He goes, oh, I got this big ranch and I got this private runway. So we go out there and we just kind of have a landing competition once a year and we put a couple thousand dollars each into this pot and then whoever has the best landing gets to keep the money. I said, oh, that sounds pretty cool. How, how does it work? I'm kind of interested. And that's where it started to get a little bit dark and scary for me. These guys in their 20s basically started this tradition and they every year would go meet up, have some drinks, get drunk, and then have this landing competition. They'd mark off a section on this private strip and whoever was the first to land on that and the number of tries, whoever was the first to land on there was able to win the pot of money. Show me the money! Now I've heard of guys getting into the flight simulators that we do training for. I've heard of, and those are very realistic by the way. I've heard of guys getting in those drunk, which you can't really hurt anybody or yourself. I mean, I, I guess you could fall over or something, but that's not really a huge thing. But doing it in a plane seems so, so stupid to me, but that's what these guys did and this is Cockpit Confessionals. Once again, I can't stress this enough. Do not ever do that. You'll be risking your life, your friends' lives, your careers, everything. In the US, we have this airline that flies into Texas a lot, and they do a lot of flights. They have some really great pilots, but they are able to sometimes bend the rules. There are rumors that they used to bribe air traffic control by sending food and pizzas. I asked an air traffic controller about that. They said they're not allowed to accept those types of things from different airlines, but I don't know. This is just a story that I was told. Back in the day when I was a regional pilot, I used to have to jump seat a lot to get to work or get home. Uh, so I was riding on the flight deck with these guys on this particular airline, which is known for flying and taxing rather quickly. As I was on my way home to Texas, we were descending in and we were going through about 13,000 and the pilot was doing about 280 knots. It was the captain that was flying on this leg. So we're doing about 280 knots and I thought, okay, nope, that's pretty normal. That's about what we do. And then at 11, he was still doing 280 knots. And as he was approaching 10,000 feet, he was still doing 280 knots. And there's a rule in the US that below 10,000 feet, you can't be doing more than 250 knots. Now, when you're a jump seater, you typically don't want to speak up. You have two pilots that are trained in what they're doing and you're catching a ride. So you don't want to speak up unless it's something that's very obvious that there's going to be death or there's going to be a major your problem or something like that, you usually try to maybe hint something or throw something out. So as we approach 10,000, I go, speed, just kind of casual like that to see if they were going to catch on. And they just both ignored me and they were both looking at everything. They weren't talking or doing other things. They were just focused on what was happening. And as we hit through 10,000, they ended up about 9,500. And I said, um, Cap, you, Cap, you're doing 280. The captain and the FO kind of start chuckling a little bit, and then the captain does this. Son, this is a Texas 250. 
Well, as we get through about 9,000 feet, air traffic control calls up and says, hey, guys, what is your speed? And then the captain says, hold on, I'll do the call. He goes, yeah, we're doing 250. We got a really strong tailwind up here, but it looks like it's about to shear off. As he says that, he yanks the speed brakes all the way back, and they end up slowing up to 250 and getting in and landing. Now, how much time did they save? I don't know, maybe 30 seconds to a minute? Uh, now, the way it is with the way the reporting is that's coming off the aircraft, you can't lie because they can see your speed. This was at a time when that stuff wasn't getting transmitted to air traffic control, so you could say, hey, I have a really strong tailwind, and they wouldn't know any better. They can see your ground speed, they can see how fast you're moving, and they know how fast the other planes that have gone through that space have gone, so they have kind of have an idea. But if you say, hey, I got a really strong 30-knot tailwind, they have no way to really know back then. Now they do, so don't do it. When you go through flight school, usually you have one or two different examiners that are assigned to different regions, and they do the exams on student pilots as they go through flight school. Usually these pilots are airline pilots or ex-airline pilots, possibly ex-military pilots, but they usually what they're doing is doing these exams on students and they make a little extra money. This is a story that I heard from an airline pilot who was also doing these types of exams on the side. It's kind of their side hustle that I always talk about, getting a side hustle when you're an airline pilot. His side hustle was doing these types of exams. So he shows up and this student is working on their private pilot license. It's the first big exam that you do as you go through flight school. And what they do is they go through your logbook and they look to make sure you've done all the necessary flights and you have all the necessary flight time and all that types of stuff. They go through all that with you to make sure that you've done everything correctly. So as he's going through the logbook, he says, I see you got some time here on 550, 550 Alpha Kilo. And the student's like, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I got a few flights on that. And he goes, wow, that's a pretty cool plane. That's a pretty cool plane. So the examiner spends about 20 minutes talking about this plane. Oh, what do you like about it? Where have you flown? And they're talking, talking, talking about this particular plane. Now, sometimes there's a strategy that pilots use when they go through these exams and try to get on the good side of the examiner is to kind of just be friendly with them and talk about whatever they want to talk about so they don't have to get deep into the systems of the aircraft. Usually the examiners obviously know what's going on, but the student pilot thinking, oh, I'm going to get away with a bunch of wasted time talking about this aircraft. So they're talking about it more and more. And he says, well, man, I've always wanted to fly in one of those types of planes. Let's do the exam in that plane. The student pilot says, oh, no, 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 no. I, I don't have the keys for that plane. I don't have the keys. I can't, I can't do it in that. I, I, I prepared on another plane. He goes, oh, you don't have the keys. If you had the keys, could we do it in that? He goes, I mean, yeah, if I, if I had the keys, we could do it, but I, I don't have the keys. It's my friend's plane. So the examiner reaches into his pocket and he pulls out the keys. He goes, yeah, it's my plane. You've never flown my plane. Oh, snap! That was the end of that student pilot's aviation career because you get caught lying to the FAA about the flight time that you have. Again, your career is over. Don't do it. At the regional airlines, the flight attendants and pilots sometimes work together and they'll do four days together. So the flight attendants will bid onto your schedule and you'll have three or four people to hang out with for four days and they're usually your friends and so it can be a lot of fun. If you have a crew that you work together, a lot of times what I would do is I would put the flight attendants bags up in the overhead or take them out over the overhead because sometimes these girls would pack a lot of stuff. At the end of a flight, when we're getting off the aircraft, the flight attendants sometimes have more to do to clean up everything than we have. So I'll usually go and grab their bags and bring them outside. As I was walking with both their bags through the aisle, I ended up accidentally banging one of the bags against the seat. I didn't think anything of it, but I could immediately feel the bag start vibrating as I was walking off the plane and I set the bag down. The flight attendants finished up their stuff and then they came off the plane and me and the other pilot were standing there. And as they came off, I said, hey, uh, Sarah, your, your bag is vibrating. Sarah reached into her bag, not opening it, but just reached in there and was like rummaging around and trying to find whatever it was that was vibrating. I carry an electric razor with me and I've had it vibrate before where it hits. So I thought maybe it was some type of a shaver or something like that but she seemed a little bit panicked as she was reaching around and trying to find it. After about 30 seconds, I said, Sarah, just open the bag. It's not a big deal. She says, no, 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 no. I got, I got all kinds of stuff in here. No, it's fine. Why don't you guys just wait for us at the top of the jet bridge? Now, typically at this airline that I was at, we would always go together. 
all the flight attendants, all the pilots, we would go together. We were friends, so we would always just hang out and walk off the plane together. We'd go eat together. We'd do our layovers together. We'd usually hang out all the time. So I said, no, no, it's not a big deal. We can wait for you. Take your time. After another 30 or 40 seconds, the other flight attendant walked up to me and she said, please go upstairs and wait. About two minutes later, Sarah and this other flight attendant end up coming up top and she is beat red. I later found out that what happened is when I was carrying her bag off the plane and I bumped it into the seat, I somehow activated her vibrator. And so she was just so embarrassed about it, which personally wouldn't really bother me, but I understand not wanting to open that up in front of a couple people you're just about to spend four days with. Obviously, I tried to play it really cool with her. We never brought it up again. And so, Sarah, if you're watching, I'm sorry. As some of you know that have been on the channel for a while, you know back in the day I used to fly private jets. Some private jets have bathrooms. Some don't. And this one, on this particular day, didn't have a bathroom. They figure you're an adult, you know that you're gonna go fly for two or three hours so that you can go to the bathroom before you get on the plane and then they save some money on the aircraft and not having to build a separate bathroom area. One evening I was flying into Houston because as you know, back in the day I was based in Texas and all I did is fly around Texas. We were flying into Texas and we were having to hold because there was a storm that was holding over the airport. Usually what happens with these storms is they blow over in 20 or 30 minutes so it's not a big deal and as they move off the field you can come in and land. You don't want to land in the middle of a thunderstorm because you have all kinds of shifting winds. It's very dangerous. It's not worth the risk. As most of you know, pilots are getting paid when they're flying or the engines are running. So with the engines running, I was thinking, great, this is some extra money, not a big deal. And so let's just sit out here and hold for another 20 minutes or an hour. I don't care. We had like three hours of gas on the plane, so it didn't really bother me. I noticed the other pilot was getting a little bit anxious and uncomfortable and he was like, man, I we should look at other airports that we can divert to. And I said, bro, we got three hours of fuel. This isn't a big deal. Let's just wait. After about 10 or 15 minutes, I could see the other pilot and we'll just call him Chuck was getting very uncomfortable and starting to talk about, no, we should just go to this other airport and deviate and go here and do that. And we need to get on the ground immediately. And, and I said, man, what's the deal? What's wrong? You, you seem like something's really bothering you. Is there something I'm not seeing? He said, man, I, my stomach doesn't feel good. Whatever I ate for lunch, I, it's not feeling, I don't feel very good. I don't feel very good. I, I, don't, I, I don't know what's going on. Me thinking on my feet, I said, oh, I have a solution. And I reached back into the first class area. I ran back there, grabbed a bag, which is used for throwing up, those little vomit bags, and I handed that to him. Chuck looked at me like, what do you want me to do with this? I said, bro, don't be embarrassed. If you feel like you're gonna throw up, just throw up in the bag. It's not a big deal. Don't be embarrassed at all. It's fine. It's not a problem. He looks over at me dead in the eyes and he says, my sick tummy is south of the equator. Now realizing what the situation was, I was trying to come up with a plan to allow him to crap in a bag before we landed. I, I didn't really know. I was looking for a trash bag or something like that. I didn't know what to do. As we started brainstorming an idea of what to do, air traffic control calls and says, hey, get ready. You're gonna be the next plane to come in to land. I look over and I said, what do you wanna do? We can go to another airport. He said, no, 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 I can definitely make it. I said, all right, do this. You focus on not crapping your pants. I'll do all the radios and I'll fly the plane. I'll do everything. Just sit there. Just sit tight, man. I'm gonna fly this thing as fast as I can. So I'm flying this plane as fast as I can. And as we're getting in, I get down. And I'm doing about 250 to about the final approach fix. I'm doing about 250, which is as fast as we're allowed to legally go. And then I just start dumping everything out to get ready to land. We come in and we land. And just as we touch down, it's not a smooth landing, but it's not hard at all. Just as we touch down, he's like, oh no. Within seconds, the entire flight deck smells of crap. Oh. I look over at him and he's like, don't look at me, don't look at me. So what I did is I opened up one of the windows, which was extremely loud. We had these little side windows that once we were on the ground, we could open up. But with the engines out there, it was extremely, extremely loud. Now the passengers obviously couldn't hear our conversation of what was going on up there. And they, I'm sure, were confused of why that window got open so quickly and why it smelled so terrible because this plane wasn't very big. But as soon as we pulled into the gate and I taxied really fast, got into the gate, as soon as we got into the gate there, I ran back, opened the door to let the passengers off. I got their bags off and they were like, why is, why'd you open the window? I said, well, you, you smell that terrible smell. As soon as we landed, there was a, a sewer line that busted towards that end of the runway and I was trying to get some of that smell out. Did you smell that smell right as we, just as we touched down how bad it smelled? They're like, yeah. And I said, yeah. So I opened the window to try to flush some of that smell out, but it, 
It's on the other side of the airport, so we probably aren't going to smell it over here, but I was trying to get some fresh air into the plane. They seem to believe it. As I came back onto the plane, he turns around. He didn't even let me get really onto the plane. He turns around and yells back to me and he says, get me two t-shirts, a new pair of pants, and a trash bag. I said, okay, yeah, no problem, man. I ran back inside. I got him two t-shirts, a trash bag, and a new pair of pants. Well, they were kind of sweatpants, but whatever. As I came back into the plane, he opened up the window that we had opened up to flush out the smell of the sewer tank, and I threw them in the window and I went back into the terminal. We were gonna have like a three hour sit there, so I thought, I'll just give him his space. A few hours later, I was thinking, man, I haven't heard from him. We better get something worked out here if people are gonna board this aircraft again. I sent him a text. Hey man, is everything cool? And I got this picture that he sent me. He ordered an air cart. These air carts are what you use to get an aircraft cool. You put these on the aircraft if you're not running the one of the engines that will help keep the aircraft cool. You'll plug this into the bottom of the plane and it will just pump cold air into the aircraft. Well, he got them to bring one of those out and then drug it and then pumped it on full blast, opened up all the windows and the emergency exits and just pumped this thing full of air and cleared out the smell. After I walked onto the plane, we never even mentioned it. We both knew what had happened, but I never mentioned it. Well, until today. Now, speaking about being very uncomfortable in a plane, if you haven't seen the video that I did with Stella where I let her fly a plane, I'll put a link to that video right here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.